It's six o'clock in London. It's seven o'clock in Valletta in Malta. 1 p.m. in New York. 1 a.m. in Hong Kong. 3 a.m. in Sydney. 10 a.m. in San Francisco. And 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Patrick L. Young. After the summer break, the IPO vid live stream series 13, episode four. That's our 76th episode, ladies and gentlemen, starts here. We can only start with one story, which has dominated world headlines for the past week. It, of course, also involved the parish of exchanges. The end of the Elizabethan era in Great Britain and Northern Ireland and across the British Commonwealth with the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning British monarch at 70 years and 214 days. They were preparing children of my era for the Queen's demise at prep school before my wife was born. Come to think of it, actually, the administration of the United Kingdom was planning the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II more than a decade before that, well before I was born. At 96 years of age, after a 73-year marriage and over 70 years on the throne, it's worth noting that barely 1% of her subjects were alive when Princess Elizabeth was born. Fewer than one in eight were alive in the United Kingdom across the Commonwealth when she ascended the throne in 1952. In the parish, I can clearly recall seeing the Queen. She visited the life floor, that was the future exchange, on the 11th of February 1992. The atmosphere in the pits was febrile throughout the day and the traders were delighted to cheer Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh as they toured the Cannon Bridge pits. Nasdaq and NICE deserve our plaudits. They have respectively captured the media in the parish on the death of Her Majesty. An elegant image of the late Queen on the wall of the Nasdaq market site marks for a highly arresting still. While a solemn Lynn Martin, dressed in black, captured the zeitgeist on video as the New York Stock Exchange floor fell silent. In tribute to the Queen of Great Britain and the Commonwealth, whose long reign touched every citizen of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, God save the King. Last week, Business Standard newspaper asked the question if the former National Stock Exchange of India CEO, Ravi Narain, had joined India's list of fallen market heroes. Two days later, with Ravi Narain currently under arrest and in custody for some days, I think, unfortunately, the clear answer is yes. Ravi's successor as NSE CEO, Chitra Ram Krishna, is also back in custody. Sad moments for the parish and very sad moments for the once poster child of the exchange era, at least the digital exchange era, the National Stock Exchange of India, which I'm sure is going to be working hard to rebuild its image under its new CEO. In happier news, congratulations to my friend and fellow world trader, Laura Mercurio. She's taking the reins at Blockchain Australia as CEO. That's a great move by the Australian blockchain lobby and one which I'm sure delights all of my fellow world traders in the Worshipful Company and indeed everyone who knows the effervescent and brilliant Laura from her many works across the investment banking industry. Of course, meantime, there's also a massive energy crisis story we're talking about here, and we're heading into winter. The incredible blitzkrieg impact of Ukraine's fight back over the last week cannot be underestimated. Leaving us today to wonder in Exchange Invest, the magazine of the Bourse business, is it curtains for Mad Vlad? I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, but I'll point you in the direction of an article I've published today on LinkedIn and Medium, because it strikes me it could well be the case that we have mispriced everything and come early next year, things could look a lot more optimistic. Have a look at that article if you get a chance after this show. Our guests today, ladies and gentlemen, are G Guy Malamid and Magnus Almquist. They are respectively representing Xbury building cloud-based exchanges. Of course, you may recognize Magnus. Previously, he has been on this show, episode number 22, where we were talking about the front-to-back digital experience exchange experience. And indeed, therefore, Magnus is in illustrious company as one of only three people so far alongside Christopher Messina and Christopher Giancarlo. And therefore, for the first person not called Christopher to make it back onto the IPO vid show.
show. <laughs> Guy is debuting this evening. Guy is a co-founder and CEO of Xpre, the exchange technology pioneer who are revolutionizing markets. Guy's been selected by investing.com as one of 12 fintech leaders that are shaping the industry. Magnus has a solid understanding of exchanges and their evolving ecosystem universe as head of sales at Xpre with over 20 years experience, including head of sales at Aquas Exchange, heading Smart Group's London office and as CTO of the London Stock Exchange Group's EDX. And may I say it's a delight to see some of our viewers already early with the comments. Good evening to you in Bonsor. It's lovely to see you. You are first man in today. And also good evening to Ian Miller. It's a delight to see you as well. Not sure who's added this comment, but we echo that this evening. God save the king, ladies and gentlemen. So to our guests, to our incredible show today. And thank you, Chris Messina. It was you, I do believe, who's been saying God save the queen. I know you've been in London this week, sapping up the incredible atmosphere of the emotions of the British people. Guy, where in the world are you today? So good evening, Patrick. Great to see you and great to be on your show. Uh, we're from Tel Aviv, 8 p.m. in Tel Aviv. Uh, and uh, let me start by offering my sincere condolences to the British people, royal family, Commonwealth, our partners and customers uh, from around the world um, for the uh, death of our uh, beloved queen. Thank you very much, Guy. Welcome to the show. And Magnus, where do we find you this evening? Hi, Patrick. Um, thank you. Um, it, and thank you for that amazing welcome. It's, it's great to be back on, on this on the show, of course. Um, so I am based in London, central London. Excellent. Good to see you coming to us today from central London. So Guy, tell us a little bit, give us the high level introduction to Xbury. So Xbury is actually, um, um, have invested many years in developing the next generation of exchange infrastructure. So we collected most of the problems that we encountered in the industry. And we developed a uh, first of its kind cloud native trading and matching engine, uh, which is asset agnostic, could tag along to your proprietary and legacy technology, uh, could create a DLT settlement uh, uh, based blockchain solution. Uh, so agnostic to blockchain as well. Um, and basically, we've started with our engines. Today, we offer full infrastructure, exchange infrastructure. So basically, you can launch your exchange in a matter of sometimes minutes, hours, or days. Um, and from an operational, operational perspective, we're cloud native, so we can run on every cloud. We can run on private cloud, uh, public cloud, on-prem. And we can deliver low latency, high frequency uh, trading capabilities. So that's really in a nutshell about our capabilities and who we are. So it's a really, really interesting platform. You're totally born digital. You're not carrying legacy technology. You only came to market, Magnus, in the course of the, the last year or so, actually, pretty much during the COVID era. Yes. Yes, that's right. And um, in, in many ways, that actually helped us. Um, the, the progress and, and the, the sales funnel and the ability to close deals that we've seen over the last period, um, I think is, is second to none and, and surpassed my wildest expectations. Um, during during the, the COVID period, during the pandemic, people were quite willing to meet like this online on screen um, to, and to actually close business deals without meeting anyone in person. Um, and the, that ability to build trust and to build rapport and be able to to convey properly what it is that we offer and also for our prospects and customers to be able to convey what it is that they need. Um, I, I think the, the pe people got used to working over Zoom and they got on, and over other social media like this. Um, and, and so, yeah, bizarrely, we were actually helped by the pandemic. 
Fascinating, fascinating. Launching into the pandemic, quite exciting. Let me just break off for a second and say, hello, Simon Hockle. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all well. Likewise, Simon, hope everything is well in your world and that all is cushy with you. Good to see you this evening. Thanks for joining us. If you've got a question for Guy or Simon, don't forget, just drop it into the comments wherever you're watching us this evening, whether it's on Facebook, on LinkedIn or YouTube. And also, if you get a chance, please send us a little bit of love, would you, ladies and gentlemen? That's always appreciated because it helps get us up through the AI algorithms and therefore it means that the video is shown to more people as we're talking. Guy, tell me a little bit about your background because I mean you've really been quite heavily involved in the startup nation in Israel so therefore you come with a, a tech heavy background. Yeah so um, I've been I've been 20 years in the tech industry. I started my career as a, as a, as a product and product strategist. I've been in various industries uh, from education technology um, um, through mass consumer products, uh, shared mobility in, uh, in the last 12 years in the fintech sector. I've been since early 2016 uh, highly involved in the blockchain industry, trying to really find real use cases um, and a partner uh, to the first and only uh, Israeli blockchain, uh, uh, institutional blockchain hedge fund. Uh, um, so basically I've been, um, I've been going through, uh, many industries, but in the last, uh, 12 years, mainly in the fintech sector. Uh, but, uh, definitely yes, here, uh, uh, in Israel, you know, we're surrounded by highly talented people being capable of solving complex, uh, problems. And I think, uh, in the world of capital markets, um, I've been encountered together with my partners and the team with one of the most, uh, um, complex and, and, and challenging solution of taking uh, the world of trading and the world of, of capital markets into the, um, into the cloud on the one hand, but at the same time, at the same time also understanding, uh, um, let's say, uh, the complexities we're dealing with. I mean, 10 years ago, if we would speak about exchanges, it would be, um, it would be only national stock exchanges. But today we see them arise uh, from a group of entrepreneurs uh, we see the diversification of financial instruments. And it was clear to us that we needed to build something on the, on the one hand, enterprise, enterprise grade solution, but on the other hand, that it could also serve light markets. Uh, so time to, time to market, but also run on the cloud. Um, from an operational perspective, it should be much more dynamic and robust than the current legacy and proprietary technology that exists out there. So basically, my uh, my my background is definitely solving problems and creating uh, uh, creating uh, product strategies and product design. Uh, but together with 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 highly skilled teams, we were able here to uh, to invest many years in developing uh, um, experts next generation solution for capital markets. That's sitting all together. So, I mean, while building this next gen solution, obviously you mentioned that magic word, cloud native. And I think it's it's very, very interesting, isn't it? Because just 10 years ago, not only were the impediments to market, and we were looking at the established exchanges and not a huge amount of competition. It was very nascent, as you say, Guy, but a lot of people would simply have said that the cloud was utterly impractical as a means for delivering an exchange. And clearly, that situation has rather changed, gentlemen, hasn't it? Magnus, tell us about it. For sure. Um, and and if, if, you, if you look at it from a sort of 10,000 feet kind of perspective, I, I think the, the change is natural and expected. We, everywhere else uh, across technical industries, com computer intensive, data intensive industries, we've seen a migration to the cloud. Um, sometimes with great resistance in, uh, initially. Um, and of course, naturally, that has come into capital markets and banks and operations and trading uh, and, and various kind of big data storage solutions and surveillance solutions and so on. If you look at the FCA in the UK, for example, they are now running everything in the cloud. Um, so, so it's a natural progression that, of course, stock exchanges marketplaces also look then into the technologies that they use um, and see if they can benefit from the synergies, uh, lower cost of ownership and, and, and flexibility that you come that you get from running operations on cloud native platforms. 
um, matching engines and running central limit order books uh, in the cloud um, has had its challenges and and it's not surprising that that is kind of one of one of the last evolutionary steps um, and the, the most the most um, easily accessible difficulty to to kind of mention and discuss is is the distribution of market data where you need multicast uh, to 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 put forward a fair and orderly market and and that is a nut that we've cracked um together with also without cutting any corners building from the bottom up a, a cloud native and SaaS delivered platform um and we're seeing the benefits now our customers our clients our prospects uh, are seeing the benefits of uh, how we can deliver these services um and it we're just at the beginning i, I think it's super exciting well, that's it. I mean, it's the beginning of a journey. Obviously, as you said just earlier, it's, it's a very exciting one because it's almost been, in some ways, quite oddly, turbocharged as a result of COVID rather than actually being the opposite where so many businesses were finding it difficult to manage to move forward during the course of COVID, which certainly makes for a very, very different story. Uh, let me also just break off by saying that um, I'm delighted to see we've got a number of messages this evening. Sorry to hear, Chris Messina, that you're in a bad reception zone, but of course you'll be able to catch the replay, as will many others, because this show will be instantly available for replay on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube as soon as the live is over. Hello, Max Butti. That was guest number 002, our very first guest there, Chris Messina, and one of our most recent guests, Max Butti from the Swiss Exchange, uh, the Swiss Digital Exchange, I should say, that arm of the, the Swiss Exchange infrastructure. And it's lovely to see you. He was guest number 69 in our pantheon of guests during the course of this show. So, okay, very interesting because, I mean, you hit a number of things there, but Let's jump to one thing that really intrigues me. I mean, everybody gets very excited about latency for super liquid products. How does latency work in the cloud? So, you know, it, it, you know you're the, the, the issue of latency, first of all, it, it's, it's solved, okay? We, we, there are several words that when we speak about cloud, everyone, immediately, you know, raise several issues. One would be latency, the other one would be security. Uh, how can we trust it? Um, so it really depends on, you know, on what do you want to achieve and what is the transaction rate you have and the amount of transactions you're running per second. Um, just to, you know, just to make things clear today, when, when, when I mentioned we're doing high frequency, low latency trading, we can do millions of transactions per second in microsecond latency. So faster and more stable than any other on-prem solution today on Earth. Um, now, this is this is to start with. So basically, latency it has to do with the amount of transactions you wanna you wanna run. Uh, it has to do with the hardware you'll choose. Okay, in contrary to the hardware uh, um, our our colleagues are using around the world, they're buying the most sophisticated hardware and a year later or two years later they'll need to invest again millions invest millions and tens of millions of dollars so i think magnus mentioned it before so the cost of ownership here is crazy so suddenly you're stuck in an in a non-innovative phase so as for as for latency um when you know we, we plan the game from the get-go and once we plan it patrick you can reach the the, the best latency um um, and sometimes much better than the ones that you have achieved on on-prem solution and on a much more cost-effective way. So, mm. so yeah, mm. that, that's on my side. Magnus, you want to add anything? Yeah, Guy, um, I think, I think you, you frame it really well. Um, and I, th I think low latency, high frequency trading, the, 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 you are bound by it. By the laws of physics, you, you can't kind of there. Are, there isn't a magic wand that kind of just solves all your issues. Um, so whether you whether you're you're physically located in LD four here in London, for example, or if you are located in a cloud data center, um, you, you're still facing the same challenges. Um, so you have to, of course, work with the data center partner, uh, be that cloud based or physically installed where you can address the issues at hand. 
And, and as Guy is so eloquently putting it, it depends on what, what you need. It depends on what you want to achieve. Um, so, so, of course, uh, proximity, um, hardware, um, distance between the matching engine and the, and the algo, etc. All of those things matter. And, and it doesn't matter if, if your data center provider is cloud-based or, or physical. It's the same questions and, this, and roughly the same answers. Yeah. Natural, last but not least, and it has to do with how we've built our tech. Um, and, and that makes our, our tech in the cloud, when we say it's native, it's not exported from an on-prem solution to the cloud, hence stuck in terms of robustness, in terms of scaling up and scaling down. You know, there are a lot of advantages once you created a machine which is native to the cloud. So that, that has also to do with the tech that we've developed and the years of R&D that we've invested in, uh, in our engines and our uh, infrastructure. Yes, I think that's a very, very good point, isn't it? Because there's so much that people think about when you can just move everything off into the cloud, which is a bit like, it's a bit like taking your furniture at home and then deciding that you're going to leave it all in one of those access storage warehouses that are littered all over London and the United Kingdom. I mean, yes, it works, but actually then you can't sit on your sofa in the same way that you used to because it's no longer in your living room. And when you've actually designed the whole atmosphere, the whole environment, that therefore your code is digitally native in the cloud. It makes a huge dis difference. I'm here talking with Xbury. We're discussing building cloud-based exchanges, ladies and gentlemen. If you've got a question for our guests, Guy Malamud and Magnus Almquist, we'll be delighted to pass them on to them. Thank you very much, Martin Watkins, also a previous alumni guest of this show, one of our earliest members to appear. Good evening, Patrick Young, Guy Malamud and Magnus Almquist. Looking forward to another insightful IPO vid. Thank you very much, at Martin, and hopefully you'll get a question in later. And indeed, let me say, I'm looking forward to see you next week as well. That should be a great evening with another IPO vid guest, Sharon Constantian. And also, we've got Ruben Indigikian. Ruben, it's lovely to see you back on the show once again as we're discussing building cloud-based exchanges with Xpre. Your comment is a very well-made one. I hope online exchanges matching sellers with buyers will help SMEs to engage in international trade and get access to trade finance. And actually, that cuts through to a beautiful question because I don't want you to give away the, the sales pipeline or who you're talking to confidentially, but you mentioned it in your introduction, Guy. You've also emphasized it, Magnus. I mean, the point of the whole system is that it's built for any asset, any kind of market, not merely the super liquids. So therefore, it does have the opportunity to revolutionize things like SME trading. So, yeah, uh, so definitely on, on, on the asset side, um, we are um, so surprised every day. I mean, we're, we're highly honored to see the, the, the most traditional enterprise grade national stock exchanges um, um, switching into cloud technology, looking into new innovative asset classes, and then definitely uh, Xbury being uh, one of the leading solutions out there today, not only to offer you free access to, to all, all of those asset classes, but also use uh, cloud technology or if required, even uh, connect to a, a DLT-based settlement solution. Uh, so that's amazing. And that's really exciting. And that's in, in, in the backbone of the solution we've created and how we envisioned the few, a part of the future. The second part of that reality are the SMEs and the surprising, exotic, quasi-exotic um, instruments that we see that we can enable them by scaling up and down and creating solutions that match those uh, uh, sellers in those markets. And this is the opportunity of us being an independent tech vendor serving the market first and not serving ourselves. And that's how we created our infrastructure by enabling also those SMEs and sometimes startups. And we have a lot of work doing with, uh, uh, with startups in order to enable them to enrich our market and open our, uh, you know, break our boundaries and surprise us because that, that's the only way of creating more and more innovation. And we can't forget that at the same time, we run juxtaposed to the regulation. Uh, and the regulators are um, seeing that continuously. And it uh, creates another very interesting uh, aspect of discussion. Uh, I don't know for this podcast, but maybe for the next one. Um, Magnus, what do you think? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I um I I love that question. I think it's a great question. And and I think it's very healthy to go back to the kind of the raw underlying purpose of capital markets. We're we're, we're here to enable financing, we're here to help companies raise capital. Uh, we're helping. Uh, we're we're here to to provide platforms for people to invest their capital and their savings, um, hopefully with a, with a healthy return. Um, and that capital should be put to good work. Um, and of course, the future growth for for any for any country for any population lies in the SMEs uh, and their ability to access capital, be it for growth or be it for for deal funding. Um, and for, for kind of procuring commodities for their own production and so on. Um, and I, I think this is, this is where expert actually makes a real difference. And, and it's, it's easy to kind of smirk at those kind of statements, but, but I, I think it is important. It, we, th through, through being so agile, by being cloud native, by being able to deploy new exchanges and marketplaces in, in a matter of days, we, we bring down the, the, the barrier of entry for new innovative type of marketplaces that ex exactly are seeking to address this market. And we, we have several ex examples of that in our prospect pipeline and customers where, where they are actively seeking to, to help SMEs uh, make, and make their capital raising a lot easier. I think that's very exciting. I mean, you hit the nail on the head there in terms of also the time to market, because that's one of the biggest problems, isn't it? I mean, if you look at Young's Pyramid of Exchanges, OK, the tier ones, they've got loads of money and they've got loads of their own tech or whatever. But by the time you get to the bottom end of tier three, where you've been dealing with a lot of these new and startup exchanges, time to market matters, not so much because of the actual time to market, but because of the cost of sitting on top of this technology. I mean, a lot of places that are taking three, six, nine months to install, and you're already paying a lot of fees before you can actually show it to the market. Um, I mean, we've had a, a couple of spectacular failures also of people integrating their technology in recent months. Uh, we'll, we'll spare most of their blushes, but I have to say the, the multi-commodity exchange of India's current fracas does make me laugh just a little bit um, as we see the revenge of 63 moons there. But nonetheless, I mean, it's very, very interesting how these how these different enterprises can manage to get going much faster. And that's obviously also a great incremental source of saving money for a startup exchange. So, I mean, Magnus, tell me a little bit about what the journey's been like, because you say you're dealing with all manner of different markets. Now, again, I'm not asking you to give anything away, but you've been dealing with some really small startups all the way up through the, through the pyramid? Yes, we, we are. Um, and for sure, that, that makes our life very interesting. So, so one, one meeting could be with, with, um, with a sort of a, a guy and his dog with a bright idea. Um, and they are pre-funding pre and they are looking for, looking for how can they kind of materialize their, their bright ideas. Um, and the next call is with, a, with an incumbent uh, sort of tier one or tier two stock exchange, uh, looking at how they can can gain efficiencies from working with someone like Xperia. Um and we have a very strong message to both of, both of them, and and I, I think that really speaks to to the strength of our technology and to the people in the company that we can we can help both of these very different types of prospects um, uh, to to excel. Well, that's interesting because actually, as we're sitting here talking about building cloud-based exchanges with Xpray, I've got a cracking question for you. It's quite long, actually. Well, I'm glad we've managed to rearrange the screen there because you disappeared. The question was so long for a moment, Magnus. Let me read it to you. It's from Martin Watkins because that's talking about another issue. You've just talked about the whole opportunity to manage to distribute markets. How has Xpray addressed the regulatory operational resilience requirements for cloud services to be resident in the respective jurisdictions. How cost effective is it to operate in three or more availability zones where they need to be located in different jurisdictions? Magnus, would you like to start on that? Sure, I can, I can, I can start. I mean, it's a great question, first of all. Um, I, th I think, and again, it's, it's, you can't cut corners, obviously, and you, you need to be in different availability zones. You need a primary and a DR and maybe even a third backup in, in a third availability zone. Um, 
but but that's also true for physical install. Um, so so again, you're you're seeing efficiencies. You're sp seeing seeing much lower cost of ownership. If if you look purely at the infrastructure cost, um, you know, as Guy mentioned earlier, you if if you were on physical install, you buy your hardware in two years, it's old, and you need to upgrade it. And and hey, guess what? You're in, in line behind the biggest buyers, which are cloud providers, to to buy the latest and greatest hardware. Um, so to, to have these two or three different installation sites uh, with a reliable um, cloud provider where you've also invested in, in a strong, good relationship with them, you will see great benefits and, and a much, much more flexible ownership. And, and we can go into a lot of detail there. I, I think it's kind of, does your backup site or your DR site, does it need to be um, available 24-7 or, or could there be some kind of giveaway where you can reduce its, its footprint uh, and then have, a, have an arrangement where you can ramp it up very quickly. That elasticity is, is a great advantage when you're running markets that fluctuate greatly in volume from, from day to day, from week to week. I think that's a very interesting um, point about the elasticity of markets. Guy, please. Yeah, I, I, I would I would also add to what Magnus just mentioned, and I think that's 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 the core of um, um, uh, the cloud evolution. There, we should we should climb up for a second and see that we're going into a cloud revolution. It's happening in capital markets, right? And and I think uh, first of all, we see the movement of the great uh, of the big birds. Uh, I mean, and, and the cloud providers. They're investing a lot of funds uh, in infrastructure. They're investing a lot in uh, capital markets. Uh, that's that's one trajectory. The second trajectory is what's happening on the regulation side. The, regu the regulators are advancing every day. Okay, so we see the the the, the mass in Singapore, and we see the FCA, and we see other regulators, and we speak to all of them. So we're aware of the changes that are taking place, and we know that their tempo is slower, and uh, in a justified manner, it's it's slower, and the requirements are there, and we have. Um, highly advanced DR solutions that will support that. And we have ways of cutting, it's still cutting costs. So when, however you look at it, okay, your cost would be lower and your solution would be more elastic and robust than your current solution. So right now it seems a bit more complex to create, uh, um, uh, to create some of the solutions based on the re regulatory requirements. But first of all, it's possible. And second, you know, in a year time, we'll probably won't see it even as a as a as a barrier to entrance. Yeah. Can't hear you. Sorry, I was muting myself against the, uh, the 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 noise in the background. The interesting part about that is that, of course, then the physical um, cost of installing is always going to be more expensive if you try to do something on-prem across different areas than it is if you're super flexible and in the cloud across several areas. Uh, it goes without saying. Uh, definitely, it will be always a much more... Uh, the on-prem solution would be um, much more expensive and, and going cloud will cut your cost, will cut your cost of ownership. And just reverting back on, on, on the point before that, even when, you know especially for, for the big enterprise players, tier ones, tier twos, and tier threes, you know, that are waiting sometimes for years uh, to get their tech, and then they need 50, 100, 25 developers to accept uh, the tech and deploy it. Um, once, you, once you cross the way to the cloud, and we haven't discussed it yet, you move also to a SaaS model, to a software as a service model, and then you get everything as a service. Uh, so you can scale up and you can scale down. So your cost is going down not only on the hardware; it's it's an overall cutting uh, cutting off your cost, and that that's important. We haven't touched that yet, but it's an important part of the revolution, also in the business model that enters the industry. 
And I think that's a great moment, actually, to enter into that conversation precisely, Guy. You're, you're prompting me beautifully. I, I could actually disappear off and quit cup of tea, actually, at the moment. It's fabulous. Um, no, you're, you're I basically right. want to co-host the I want to co-host uh, you're, you're the You're doing such you. a good job. We'll, we'll, we'll get you back. No problem whatsoever. Or even better, bring us over to Tel Aviv and we'll, we'll do a couple oh, of shows from there. On, that sounds like an idea, you know. That's this is, Done I, But remember, I come from Belfast, same place as Kaim Herzog. Um, vitally important to always remember in, the, in these conversations. So the you mentioned that. I mean, you know, a lot of people think of going to the cloud as just taking your pictures, sticking them from the base of your computer in the Dropbox. But actually, when you've got the 3D moving parts of computer technology and you've designed something for the cloud, everything is changed about your relationship, right? Correct. I mean, imagine the three of us are opening now a new podcast, an amazing show, and we'll need to open three new accounts for our email. It'll take us about 10 minutes to log into whatever email provider and launch email accounts to all of us and all the people that are working with us. And same, yep. uh, same for Exbury. I mean, the, the, the great evolution that we're serving here is that once you've decided to open a new market or replace an old market, um, and use our engine or our full, uh, uh, full infrastructure solution. Um, once, once we understand your market, you don't need 50 or 100 developers to wait for the tech and then start m massaging uh, the, the tech and preparing it and supporting it. You know, it's, uh, it's a totally different ballgame. Basically, you're getting everything as a service. Okay, so if you order, if you get a new feature, going live soon okay you'll simply see it on your system and that is you know just and, and that is that is a SaaS model that we know from so many other industries but our industry still doesn't use that um, um uh, that model so that that's very exciting for our clients and prospects um especially the the, the highly enterprise grade solutions but also for the startups it seems like it goes without saying and for the SMEs, yeah. it goes without saying. Um, but for the more established markets, uh, it's it's a change. It's a change of paradigm. And I think once they understand it, it's like uh, it, it's a winner. It's fascinating. I mean, that whole paradigm shift because, as you say, you no longer need to have an office with even for small exchanges, four or six or eight or 10 devs sitting around who all have to sit around for three or four or six months while you're installing your software in order to get it ready, to put it in the basement, to do everything. Because, okay, it's not necessarily the work of a couple of hours, but we are starting to talk days and weeks rather than talking months and years. And equally, I can, I can, I, you know, the other thing I have to say is I can see that there are a lot of hoteliers who are going to be very upset because there's no longer the same need to spend three days in some exotic resort doing design study meetings because you have the technology. It's effectively giving somebody the way to just tailor that to what they need, which is a matter of days, weeks, rather than being months and years. Yeah. First of all, you're right. We love design studies. We still love design studies. We love understanding our clients, understanding the problem in order to bring the right solution. But our, our tech is so robust and scalable that once we understand it, and you know, it's, it's a challenge uh, uh, with me being in meetings, my, one of my partners uh, heading our products, you know, sometimes I surprise them, not sometimes, almost every meeting I surprise them. And once we understand what's the market live during the meeting, I ask them to configure a system and show everyone. And that's the, that's the moment where they see how robust and special um, uh, our solution is. Uh, and, but you're totally right, Patrick. That's, that's a change in paradigm that in any other business, you, 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 know, you know it's happening already, and it should be also in ours. It, it's, yes, it all shocks me that you've got everybody's using Gmail or some sort of mail in the cloud. We're sharing documents in the cloud. We're using Dropbox. We're using everything. Home, everywhere. I mean, our recipes are stored in Dropbox. We've got everything in the cloud, and then you go to an exchange, and people want to take you around a room on the second floor of the basement in order to look at huge amounts of cabling. <laughs> You're Sorry, so right. Magnus. You were going to say something. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I think we covered the point really well. But the, the move, moving from uh, an on-prem and in-house managed uh, 
paradigm to a SaaS driven paradigm is it, it's there is a journey to to kind of wrap your head around what that actually entails and what that actually means and i, I think guy has, has explained that very carefully and that's where the true the true gains the true winnings are lying for sure your infrastructure is is easier to maintain uh, and it's a, an easy relationship with 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 your hardware and, and making it humming and running in, in in a cloud installation but then also is this whole other layer of managing your your installations, your software, making sure it's running, and so on. And and to uh, not only not only do we see these huge savings in the initial install, getting yourself up and running, but then also uh, ongoing running, um, and that maybe there the savings are even greater. And that you you don't need large upgrades anymore, um, regardless for the reason for that underlying upgrade. You you know infrastructure is seamlessly. Um, expanding as your business grows um, you're continuously on the latest version um, and and so so this whole idea of large upgrades it, it's it just evaporates so the large upgrades evaporate and also then presumably on an ongoing basis a client exchange can compress what has been the classic IT team down to some systems administrators. And I mean, actually, what do you yeah. need then if you're using Xpray as your IT team? That's a great question. And, and that varies from exchange to exchange and, and how their sort of wider system picture actually looks like. Um, but when it comes to, to managing um, the technology, the services, the solutions that we provide, and, and then it's, it's, all, it's all business management. Um, and of course, having having the the in-house ability to challenge us and and to manage us properly, and to ask the right questions to us. Um, but, but chiefly, you can really be focused on setting up and configuring and managing your your market, your customers, um, and the, the assets that you're making available for trading. Very interesting. Let me pop over to Ian Miller. Hello again, Ian. Lovely to see you this evening. He's asked another long question. How does the latest nuance of cloud-based exchanges fit within the rollout, which is underway across all exchanges, of regulation to all crypto businesses? How does that work? I mean, how do you manage to integrate in terms of delivering crypto assets and then also delivering all of the regulatory bells and whistles that are needed in an exchange system. Um, going yeah, yeah I, I, can, I can start there. It's it's funny, right? Because I I I hardly understand the question anymore. I'm so used to it now. Um, and and yeah, and it's a great <laughs> question. So I, pre I appreciate that you're asking it. I I think we we've built Xperia to be compliant with capital markets requirements from the bottom up. Um, and we've now passed through so many of the audits and, and the, the detailed analysis of our, our exchange technology, our services, and how it's delivered that we know that it, it meets those very stringent requirements. Um, the, the, and, and also going on then to the adoption of cryptocurrencies in, in whatever form they, they, they will evolve into and, and the necessary then integration with various forms of blockchain technology, um, the, the, then you almost take cloud for, for granted. Um, to integrate with DLTs, uh, to, to then be much more flexible in, in the interfaces and, and where you get data from and, and where you send data to. Um, I, I think, yeah, it, it just needs to be cloud native. It 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 need, it's it just kind of it's a natural progression um, that that we see that is pushed forward by the crypto ad adaptation that we see across the globe. And it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, we we, we see a lot of people talking about the legacy exchange business and the cloud and the, the the digital asset business as being entirely different. Whereas it all seems to me that they're remarkably similar. I mean, they're like one side of the Twix versus the other side of the Twix with bells and whistles. But your design is completely asset agnostic. We're completely asset agnostic, referring to the previous uh, long question about crypto. Crypto assets will will uh, will run on the cloud. Uh, as as a fact, uh, the DLT solution has to do with a real use case of blockchain technology, which is something else which connects to your, to your current question, Patrick. 
And, and I think one of the major differences would be the settlement solution, which are blockchain based. And there we might see maybe change and um, um, a difference in approach uh, from one uh, geo to another. Uh, but once you speak about highly liquid assets, uh, then one will need to adopt a DLT solution in order to uh, uh, support uh, this kind of business. I think that's very interesting because obviously you're looking at a lot of different kinds of assets and also even in the, in the crypto and digital asset business. I mean, a lot of these things are highly liquid. A lot of them are also highly illiquid. It's just like the legacy asset business. How do you then manage to get around delivering the ideal environment for all parties in these different kinds of exchanges? That's, a, that's an amazing question. I think that's one of the, uh, of the core questions of understanding Xbury. Xbury is a managed service. What we've created, we've created, we've created to the world. Okay, now the core um, is so robust and elastic. Okay, and when we say it's asset agnostic, it's asset agnostic. We're supporting all assets. Um, and we can simply configure it in a very easy way today uh, and and it's not an easy task to do but it has been done in years of development um, but that's that's the backbone of everything uh, we've created and and that's now it's the fun stuff you know you come with a um, with a blockchain based asset highly liquid needs settlement on a certain blockchain with a very let's say specific topologies like every instrument has okay once we understand it and that's the design study you mentioned before or that's the that's the chat we're having on a cup of coffee just to understand what you want to do with this instrument how you're going to trade it and once we understand it it takes us really not a lot of time uh, to configure it and then you can run with it fabulous i mean that makes a really really interesting discussion and i suppose and i'm actually i'm quite shocked actually that we haven't heard this while we've been discussing building cloud-based exchanges for the last 45 minutes well what exactly then are the pitfalls to going into using and building a cloud-based exchange what is what sorry i i, I couldn't hear the, the pitfalls beginning. So that's all right. What are the pitfalls? Um, yeah, go ahead, Magnus. You want to start? Yeah, well, like I can give give a couple of snippets. I, I think we we're, we're living in a, in a what fundamentally is a very mixed world right now, especially if we're looking at the crypto ad adoption. So we we have a exchanges, marketplaces uh, that are operating in in a kind of near real time settlement environment. Um, uh, so it's only T, T plus zero settled. Um, and then we have a, a, a large bulk of, of institutions that represent the, the lion's share of, of the invested capital in, in, the, in the capital markets world, where things are settled T plus two or even longer. Um, and to, to marry those two, to live in a, in a mixed world with different settlement cycles and, and different reconcil reconciliation requirements and and the different support levels in, in the kind of post-trade uh, part is, is one of the big challenges, I think, for anyone who wants to bridge both of those worlds. Um, the, so, so I think that is one, one of the big pitfalls. Um, the the other, other thing to really carefully think about is, is, as always, when you launch something, is kind of who, who are your clients, who is your target audience, and how will they connect? How will they reach you and what are their requirements? And then make sure that you can meet those. Um, and with most uh, cloud providers today, you can. Uh, but, but you need to think about it and you need to have that conversation with, with us and, and with the cloud provider of your choice. But in essence, what you're actually saying is that most of the problems that you're going to have in the cloud are actually the same problems as you're going to have if you're on-prem, if I may say so. I mean, there's no, there's no fundamental problem with going to this exciting new managed solution, software as a service, having your market in the cloud that actually is a new bump in the carpet. Um, although I suppose some people may say, I mean, you know, it surely there must be some sort of an issue with latency. I mean, I think probably at least to the average human, they think, well, there's got to be 
kind of some sort of a latency issue. How does that actually manage to work in the cloud? Sure. So if, if you're high frequency colo and you have participants that worry about the length of fiber uh, from the pop to their algo, um, if that is your predominant kind of target customer base, um, then, then you will need to work very closely with a cloud provider because you, you need to make sure um, that the racks that your, your service are sitting in um, are well known and well understood and also that that same cloud provider can provide uh, access in racks that are very close. And, and you, you, in effect, mimic and, and MD4 set up uh, but by using using a cloud provider to do that, um, that is today possible. But but it it requires a lot of homework and a lot of discussions, etc. But but for sure, in that very niche space, then then those those are challenges. And and, and actually, sorry, just one thing that occurs to me as as we're talking here, you mentioned cloud providers. Are you essentially cloud provider agnostic? Or is there an issue in terms of what a cloud provider needs to be able to do to work with the high performance of the Xpre system? We are definitely cloud provider agnostic. Uh, and, and even more than that, if we understood that the best solution for you still is to be on bare metal, we are capable, more than capable, of doing bare metal installations as well. Um, so, but as to the cloud, definitely we're a cloud provider uh, agnostic. Excellent. Excellent altogether. Got a couple of questions and uh, comments. Thank you very much for the love. Beate Young, John T, a very interesting discussion this evening. It is a very interesting discussion building cloud-based exchanges, I think, all around. And there are so many points about this whole new world of thinking that are just absolutely fascinating in relation to where we've been previously with how markets work. So therefore, uh, Magnus, give us a little flavor. I mean, what are the sort of markets that we are hopefully going to expect to see on Xpre in the near future? Sure. Um, that's a great question. Um, and the, the, there are, I actually have two, two separate answers. The what I want to see and what I hope to see is that we we see a tokenization adoption broadly across capital markets. So we we start building exchanges and marketplaces where where reconciliation processes and settlement processes and so on are reduced down to to T zero, um, and and using smart contracts to create, transfer, and store those assets uh, with with a cloud native matching engine sitting on top of that infrastructure, I think that that is the future. I, I think that is, is undoubtedly so. So so I, I I do predict that we will see quite a rapid ramp up of tokenizing of what we could call normal assets. Um, the other answer is 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 that I, I, I just don't know. It's so exciting. The innovation, the rate of innovation, the new type of assets that we're seeing, the type of the type of exchanges and marketplaces the, and the innovators behind those marketplaces, it's, it's completely new type of players. And they are also reaching out to a completely new type of investors that are used to, uh, to, used to a very different way to absorb information and make decisions and then their expectations how to access these investment products. It's a completely new world. Um, and I, th I think that that is super exciting. We're, we're only seeing the very, very, very beginning of that. And there are lots of buzzwords with Web3 and so on around that. But the, fundamentally, it's about how do you deliver information? How do you help people make investment decisions? And once they've made that decision, how do they access the instruments they want to trade? And that world is just going to change completely over the next several years. And, and we're part of that evolution. And yeah, I, I keep saying that. It's very exciting. I think that's enthralling altogether. So therefore, actually, I think that leads us really elegantly to, you know, the final question of the show, which is really, you know, where do you think the revolution goes next? And in some ways, maybe you've answered that, Magnus, but perhaps you've got something to add to it before we go to Guy. You're good, Magnus. You think you've added everything you need to to. I leave I leave that to Guy with warm hands. You're gonna leave you're <laughs> gonna leave it to uh, to the CEO. Well, Guy, you're sitting in the startup nation 
Israel, an incredible history that we've seen of amazing development, a massive tech hub, but at the same time, not somewhere that's really been super associated with exchanges over the year, although we've seen a fabulous rejuvenation of the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange just in the course of the last couple of years. Where do you think the capital market revolution goes next? So first of all, you've touched the, 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 one of the most painful uh, uh, points. And one of our challenges also is an Israeli-based uh, uh, tech vendor, tech company, uh, is to expose Israel uh, uh, to the world of capital markets and the financial industry and bring and then attract more and more players uh, to Israel. And by that, actually opening our arena uh, to that world um, and being able to bring more and more innovative solutions and tech um, uh, to our um, to our industry, so that's that's on a on a personal note and a professional um, and a professional note. Um, as for the industry, I definitely think that um, I mean the last um, research that I read said that the tier ones and the tier twos of national stock exchanges will move to the cloud only around 2026 um, till 2028. I believe that in the coming. 12 to 24 months, we will see most of the tier ones and the tier twos move to the cloud already. Okay, we will see this innovation using also cloud based matching engine, uh, native uh, uh, matching engines, uh, which are cloud uh, based. Uh, we'll see them integrated already. Uh, today, um, having Xbury is the only one out there, uh, but hopefully, we'll see uh, that evolve. Um, I believe we will see more and more DLT-based settlement solutions, uh, and that's really depending on, 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 on the regulators in different uh, uh, geos. Um, but I think it's one of the most real use cases that I've encountered, uh, again, using centralized order book, and that's something we believe and, 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 and stands behind Exbury uh, and our industry. Um, so that is, that is definitely... Uh, another thing I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, the change of investors. I mean, today, looking at, you know, 18 years old, um, investing in a different way, and by that, creating new markets and new innov innovative instruments. I think that's intriguing, and I think that's one of the major changes um, that will um, create new entrepreneurs and new markets. And that's what I want to see. I want to see the diversification of instruments in the coming year. And I want to see the diversification of markets by having young and enthusiastic entrepreneurs being able to launch their markets with solutions like Xberries and more uh, because we make it available and we make it applicable for the smallest markets and the most uh, big and traditional markets. So that's from my perspective. I hope it's enough. I have more if we have another hour. I think that other R is going to be used in the near future, but I think it's going to be in another show, possibly with my new co-host here, Guy Malamud from Tel Aviv. Who knows? <laughs> that has been a fascinating surmise because I think you go back 25 years, what we'll be talking about in Capital Market Revolution, the book, we were talking about liquidity, accessibility, transparency. The thing that you hit on the head with the whole cloud revolution, which makes me so excited as a builder of exchanges and someone who enjoys helping other entrepreneurs build their exchanges and their markets of future is that whole agile cloud-based opportunity that you're enabling because it allows people to come in and build exchanges with technology that is state-of-the-art, but on the other hand is state-of-the-art without them having to take on the whole concept of a legacy technology department. And therefore, as you said, Magnus allows them to have the instant upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, as you were saying, Guy, is asset agnostic, is settlement agnostic. And it's going to be so exciting to see what we can manage to bring together in the blockchain future of settlement, as you were talking about, Guy, and also tokenization, as you were talking about, Magnus. This has been an absolutely fascinating glimpse of the next generation of exchanges. Will it be 12? to 24 months will it be 2026 or 2028 by the time that the tier ones and the tier two exchanges in young's pyramid catch up well that we're going to find out you can catch our latest podcast instantly 
ladies and gentlemen, with Tom McMahon. We've been talking about um, energizing new markets. That was just a couple of months back. We were discussing that with Tom. And equally, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking next week to coming of age with ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange. And that's going to be with, well, I hesitate to say it about any lady, but she has been there for over 20 years, Catherine Katamashi. Katerina Karamashi has been genuinely a veteran of life in the equity products revolution that we've seen taking place over the course of the last 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patrick L. Young. Our guests today were Ken Mel Ahmed and Magnus Almquist. We've had a fantastic roster of different presentations and people engaging with us. Thank you very, very much to each and all of you. Ian Bonsori and Miller, Chris Messina, Simon Huckle, Max Butty, Martin Watkins, Ruben Indijiki and Bertie Young and John T. Thank you to the production team of Jamil, Racy and Mary. I I wish you a great day, a great night in blockchain life and markets. This is Patrick Young saying good night. Good night.